It says it's streaming. I have no way of actually checking. Well, I suppose I could put an iPad out. Then we'll start to get um, weird echoes. Once I've had to turn. Project two is a little bit harder. And it was actually fun. People are like asking these questions, and I'm like going, wow, got the clock lecture. Realize that that's that cool bridge where you have to move from study this theory crap, and then you actually have to implement it, and you're like, oh, what we're implementing are clocks. Sequence numbers are nothing but clocks. And that's the way I've always thought of them. And even when I was talking about the networking section, I talked about the fact that it's just this number that goes up. But the cool part is when you add two clients there with no synchronized clock, and they're using a monotonically increasing number, and someone was unimaginative and decided they're going to write the code, they're all going to start at zero, which does, in fact, remind me of an interesting failure that happens in virtual machines. Where in virtual machines, if the data center experiences a power outage that lasts longer than the UPS lifetime, and that does happen, Everything spins up at the same time. And I, there's a class of failure I'm going to talk about today that uh, it, it's exactly this. Everything spins up at the same time. And so one of the things that will happen is that when you turn all of the machines on at exactly the same time, they all get these inrush surge currents. And what happens? The circuit breaker pops. You know, it's like you got the toaster and the microwave and your laptop. And then you decide you're going to plug in the space heater all to the same outlet, and you turn them all on at once, and boop, they all go off. So they actually then build cycles into there. You randomize the start time. So not everybody starts at exactly the same time. And I hadn't really thought about it, but of course the code is super, super simple. Everybody starts at zero. Okay, and that creates a class of problems that you will see in the real world. Then it's like, okay, and when we talked about that, we really only talked about peers talking to each other when we went to the multi-clock situation. We were doing the, the whole flow across the system, and, and it was everybody could talk to everyone else. But then we gave you this, this project where, well, there's really only one person everybody's talking to, and nobody else talks to each other. Kind of like in class, right? Um, the only entity that needed to keep a vector clock was the server, not the client. Great. It's actually ground back into the lesson. Who knew? Cool. And so there are, as you begin to think about that, at least as I started thinking about it, I'm like, there's some really cool things there that we didn't talk about that do flow logically. And that is, as we get more clocks, we get more actors, we get more players, some of them will be talking to each other, but not to others. So, and I know this because I've read these papers and whatnot, those vector clocks can be sparse. Because if you've never talked to somebody, or they've never talked to you more precisely, they've never talked to you, you don't actually know what time they think it is. And that was cool. And the other interesting thing was that people assumed that, like, their timers were going to be called, and I'm like, why? And you're writing a test harness. Why would you, and you're not simulating packet loss or delay. Why would you call the timer function? I mean, you build the timer function in there because you're building for the general case, but then in fact what happens when you test it is you only test a subset, and there's another flaw or another problem that ar arises all the time in distributed systems. Things you test for are a very small subset of the things that will actually happen. And I can tell you from personal experience, if you don't test for something, it's not uncommon for it to fail when it actually happens. Oh, look, it's uh, 16 minutes before. Maybe they'll fix that in 2024. Oh my gosh, my clocks are out of sync. The one here, 758, now it's 759. 
I'll, I'll, I'll use the official UBC time. At the tone, the time will be. Um, National Institute of Science and Technology in the United States has two radio transmitters. They actually transmit a signal with the time and a human voice, a recorded human voice. But it says, uh, it, it calls out the time. And I remember setting up my amateur radio a long time ago, and that was one of the first things you did is you tried to tune in WWV out of Boulder, Colorado, or WWVH, which comes out of someplace in Hawaii. And when you're on the West Coast, you can get both. And they're fairly low frequency, so they tend to bounce and whatnot. So they could be out of phase with you. And get two sources of time that are slightly different. Now we're talking about very, very small differences because it doesn't take very long for um, a radio wave to get from Hawaii to But it takes slightly longer than it does to come from Colorado. But then you start putting bouncing in there I went after models. Um, I don't know if anybody has noticed, but in theory, you're supposed to be able to see the project three, four, and five code now. I don't know. Can you see it? Did I do it right? The problem with anything that you do manually is it's really easy to screw it up. And it's even harder when you can see it because you had an access control on it that gave you access all along. And you change that access control and you hope to hell that you did it right. You have no way of testing it except to create like a dummy account. And of course, you'd be locked down. I can't even move. I tried this. I tried moving the grades from Gradescope into Canvas. I've joined the class since the last time they, man they manually synchronized the, the rosters. Um, I can't import them. Even though I can see that they are in the class and I can see the grades on Gradescope, but the magic key that links them together isn't there. So I have to email someone, create a ticket, and they will then go do this synchronization. Like, you know, I know how to actually take Excel spreadsheet version. But that would be a manual step, and I don't really want to. So hopefully today I'll get them to. And now it's 8.01, so everybody who's going to show up is maybe here. So, so legit crap. I always got to start with you know the boring stuff because you're struggling to stay awake anyway. I can see people yawning. Uh, project threes, four, and five have all been released. They have different due dates. I realize this is kind of a dirty trick, right? Here you go. You can do this stuff. Here are the due dates for the full credit assignment. And then I already saw somebody was procrastinating the report. I'm going, well, you know, you could probably submitted a, a partially completed report. And, and then you say, and then say, okay, now I'm going to go back and finish it afterwards. And maybe I get 80% on the first one. And I'm going to max myself out at 75 on the second one. I'm always amazed how people put the reports off until like two minutes after the deadline. This is part of why I like this. The other class that I do at Georgia Tech, there's a hard deadline. You don't get any uh, slack. Can't submit late, and um, and and there's always like five people in a class of a few hundred who say, "Oh, I just missed the deadline." You had no submission limit. You could have submitted at any time. Why didn't you just like you do it like you'd save things to get? Okay, I made a change. Save. It. Made a change. Save it. Very interesting. Procrastination will get you, uh, and so this is the. A, a dangerous trap, and I'm trying to warn people, don't fall into it. Don't put these off until the last minute. Part of the reason that I short-fused Project 1 initially and then gave you an extra week on it anyway is I wanted people to start working on it. Project 1 is about, as I was saying, Project 1 was about making sure that your environment was set up. Project 2 was about doing a little bit of pretty lightweight coding. And then got that nice ex, ex, uh insight in that, wow, this is actually about those clocks that we were talking about, which I think is cool. Um, you can submit all the way up until the 13th of April at 11.59 p.m. I don't recommend that you wait until um, the 13th of April at 11.50 and decide you're going to do the project. That's not a winning scenario, but 
just take some pressure off of you. You know, if you're, you're struggling to get it done on time and you're below 75%, you work on it. If you get 78% on it, and no sense spending more time on it unless you feel that you're going to gain. You're going to learn. Your primary objective is to maximize your grade in the course. I'd rather have you spending your time working on the next project. Um, alternate passes one and two. A couple of people have talked to me about them. Most we haven't. Uh, initial proposal is due on the 30th of January. I haven't changed the office hours, although I will probably, I might not be on time on Thursday. I have a dentist appointment that's done. Time for me to do. Thursday's a crazy day. Today's uh, class, departmental meeting at 12.30, two, I have a dentist appointment at 2.30, like, I can make it back by four. Wrong. That should be, wow, I still can't do it right. It's 1,600, not 1,400. Go ahead. Here, we can fix that. 1,600 to 1,500. I might be able to back to here. Oh, see. Back to a couple of readings. Um, the impossibility of distributed consensus with one faulty pro uh, process is, in fact, uh, the, the bulk of what we're talking about today. That's just the more formal paper. So I'm going to be trying to give you a more intuitive sense of what the says. And if you are one of those people who really needs to understand the details, you got the paper. I actually recommend a different formulation of essentially the same insight, which is the two generals problem. If you've never heard of this, it is a well-known problem in distributed systems as implemented by a military. You have generals on different peaks, and there's a valley between them. And the observation is there's actually no way to verifiably coordinate to given a certain set of, of um, circumstances. I think that's going to be really interesting here. And that, I, I, even when I first started looking at teaching this course, I was like, this is the underlying lie, the distributed systems, which is we're going to be able to communicate and figure all of this stuff out. The nice thing about that paper impossibility of distributed consensus. The nice thing about that paper is it proves we are lying. We can't actually solve this problem. And now we're going to play the shifty trick. Of course, if we couldn't solve the problem, why would we have this class at all? So we're going to play some shifty tricks in order to make it at least partially solvable. Anybody have any questions at this point? Time to answer those burning questions, although people have been reasonably active on Piazza and Discord, so. Yes, all the remaining projects are to be done solo, um, unless you're doing one of the alternate path projects. Uh, the, there's the one that's a team. That's just me saying it don't like projects. That's been my experience. Always somebody who complains about the fact that they they carried. I've never heard anybody complain about the fact that they were carried. Don't know why. Have you got any funny stories to share? I saw a nice post on Reddit about broken clocks last night. That made me laugh. And I was thinking, yeah, they'll probably get that fixed in like 2025. So apparently, this isn't a unique problem. And then I thought about it, and I said, it's kind of a holdover from a time when not everybody carried around uh, guest trackers in their pocket. Like the people connected with nanobots. That same. And do you have a phone in your pocket? If we wanted to track you, it would be a lot easier to use that massive device in your pocket than some sort of tech. Okay. 
go figure. I'm, I'm going to go a little bit in a different direction this time. Um, okay. He's got a blog because he's basically pitching a book that he sells. But he has a nice description of general classes of failures. And I thought it was a good way of talking about, we're going to see this over and over again, because I'll go back to talking about specific failures higher level, what's a general failure. Single points of failure, and I loved a couple of these. I thought these were great examples of how things go wrong. A non-replicated configuration database. So you have a, a distributed service that relies on a non-distributed configuration database. One of the projects I mentioned, I think is a suggestion for open source uh, direction, was Zookeeper. Apache Zookeeper is actually used largely for distributing configuration files. You can use it for other things as well. But I would say that it is probably most frequently used to make sure that your configuration itself is actually distributed out. It's a very easy mistake to make. You build this fancy distributed system, and you put a copy of the configuration file in a place that could become inaccessible. If it fate shares with the service, then you don't really care. But of course, the reason you don't do that is because it's a distributed configuration, and you need to have different nodes all configured in a consistent or coherent fashion. So you then put it in a centralized place so you can manage it and fix all the configuration there. But then if that's not replicated, all of those services now have a single point of failure. This is a very common problem in distributed systems. You spend a lot of time focusing on the things that you think are going to go wrong. You build solutions to this, and then you forget about cases. Oh, I have SSL certificates that I need because I have to talk to that service through HTTPS. But those SSL certificates are not automatically renewed. Ever gone to a website where you get that nasty warning? You should not do this. It's not safe. Because someone didn't pay someone to generate a magic number relative to the expiration time of the previous magic number, i.e. the SSL certificate. This is less of an issue now because there are better automation tools for automatically renewing certificates. Um, Electronic Frontier Foundation, EFF, actually pushed a whole project around automatically issuing and reissuing certificates for SSL that didn't charge money called Let's Encrypt. Let's Encrypt has made a huge difference here because it means now it pushed people who charge hundreds of dollars to get these SSL certificates to make their processes automatable. And it encouraged people to use them on pretty much all of the websites. And, and it's made a huge difference. It really has. It's very rare for me these days to see the website. You see, you see S a lot. If you're hitting my, my posts, the class stuff, you'll notice that has an SSL certificate. Because I'm doing this too long, I'm not going to put my website on, on net without an SSL certificate. That would be I do that well enough myself. I thought it was great. And and I can tell you just reading the, the sysadmin subreddit is great because we talk about this problem all of the time. How large organizations have hundreds, not thousands, of SSL certificates, sometimes generated by small groups who are working on a particular project that then gets involved in production and gets used. And then the person who was responsible for renewing it disappears. Or the people who are in the back office say, you know, we could save a lot of money if we didn't, didn't do this. We stopped spending this money. And so then the SSL certificate don't get renewed. And suddenly you find out that some services your organization depended on failed. Automation is our friend because automation is much less likely to do things wrong and or inconsistently than we are. Slow networks. And this is really germane to the conversation we're going to have because the model we are going to start with is one where the, we guarantee the message will get there eventually. How long is eventually?
This is a huge issue. It was an issue. Um, there's a one of the one of the people I worked with at Stanford did early work in what they call least was this idea that we get a guarantee hash consistent. A guarantee it has a time bound on it. So we do this in other things as well. We do this uh, IP addresses get very an IP address comes with time and expiration. And the reason we do that is so we can actually think about when we can declare something as dead. If you get your laptop out and you get an IP address automatically, you don't really think about that. But IP addresses are a finite resource. So if I let you keep your IP address, even though you only ever use my network once, five years from now, I've run out of IP addresses to hand out and life gets bad. How do I deal with that? I say, you can use this for an hour or a day or a week or a month. What's the right number? But if somebody has a, it's a, a definitive answer, I'd love to hear. There is no, that's the problem. So you end up making these judgment calls. Say, I don't know. I'll make it time out every second. So now you're renewing your IP address every second. Can I keep using this? Can I keep using this? Can I keep... So now we've overloaded our network with lots of traffic. If I make it once a year, at some point I get a failure and then I have to purge everybody's IP addresses and start all over again. So we pick something between those two. And this is a very common strategy. But when we start talking about this model, we are gonna say, the messages are all gonna get through. And what we're going to see is that's what leads us to the situation where we say this has failed, that we cannot actually achieve our goals in this system. And part of our trick here is going to be to say, we're going to only allow a message to be played a certain amount, then we're going to declare it dead. How long is that? We could do it by time. We can actually use the clock. Well, okay, we'll wait for an hour to see when that clock Tells us an hour has passed. Not going to work very well. We invented these things, sequence numbers, logical clocks. We invented these logical clocks and we said, okay, now we've got logical clocks. How long do I wait? Because now it's not based upon any kind of time in, in the absolute, in the real world. It's based upon how many messages have I sent. So if I don't send you very many messages, I can keep it for a long time. This becomes an important issue in networks because people use it as an attack vector. Anybody ever received a piece of spam email? Um, some clever person figured out that when you have a blacklist and you just disconnect from the, the other sites immediately, you minimize the amount of time they waste sending you messages and so they can go try somebody else. And so they'll find someone else who's not protected well. So some clever person said, you know, SMTP protocol, the protocol for sending mail over the internet, has a, a timeout window. And so what we're going to do is we're going to wait. We're going to start talking to you, and we're going to wait right up to that timeout window, and then we'll send you a response. So you keep your connection open so you can't use it to talk to somebody else who's not doing this. So we normally think of this kind of attack as being a denial of service attack, but denial of service attacks go both ways. You can use that against a malicious actor. So that's a cool example of a failure where someone was clever enough to say, we can this fail those people. Spam's a huge Most of the traffic is spam. Eric. Spend inordinate trying to get out as much as possible. So, how long should we wait isn't necessarily always immediately obvious. We have to think about that. We may have to try different things. And what happens if we don't wait? Well, then we end up with cases where spammers can send spam faster or legitimate connections drop because the network is degraded. 
So it's a balancing act. There's no perfect solutions here. This is where the practice of building distributed systems is different than the theory. In the theory, we have this la 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 beautiful model where messages always get delivered, might be a little delayed, then we find out that that melts down. And that's all we're really going to talk about today. I'm going to tell you the big lie, and then I'm going to spend the rest of the class talking about how we're going to get around the big lie. Still going to have this. Um, TCP factor in running out of connection. The, the longer the connections are kept alive, uh, the, the harder this becomes. It has a finite number of ports. That it, number. We reserve 1,024 of them in the beginning, privileged ports. So we really only have you know, 4,000 or whatever. 65536 minus 1024. Um, and this is a real problem. Which is one of the reasons why the internet is looking at UDP, TCP. Stateless, we don't have same port numbers to make any difference. So it gives us a, a different, it gives us a different set of problems is what it really gives us, but it solves that particular problem. What I, what I really liked about this blog is that it did a nice job of doing a high level summary of the kinds of failures and recognizes that we're talking about failure. Demand spikes, I already mentioned this a little bit. You know, so um, I replicate a service, I have a load balancer. So the load balancer, which is a form of form, it's a proxy server. You have to put a proxy server in there that then distributes the packets back and forth between two or more services, distribute load out across them. One of the services, one of the servers fails. So the load balancer notices that one of the servers fails, and so it starts sending the messages to the other server. Well, now the other server is suddenly got a hundred percent spike in bound traffic, and it slows down. So if you don't have admission control, in other words, if you don't start telling people on the other end, sorry, we can't handle your call right now, what happens is it just forwards it to the server, and this this now double, imagine you, you work together, and then he gets run over by a bus. But you're now expected to get 100% of the work that you both were doing. I'm like, mama. Yeah, you know, hey, we're going to lay off 35,000 people and expect the rest of you to do all their work. Like, it doesn't work, right? So now, now you're stressing out because you're working harder and everything's taking longer and your boss is looking at you going, what's your problem? Why are you spending so much more time and you're, you're not keeping up with the workload? You two were able to do it and we know you were better than he was. That happens in real distributed systems as well. And again, we're getting back to that question. How long do we wait? Now it's this client. How long does the client wait for the server to respond? Ever notice you get to a website and it's like, oh, my, my blog post is kind of like, right? Posted WordPress thing. So it's sitting there on top of 465 of these. And if we all get a spike, nobody's going to actually get a response. So this happens in the real world. Um, that can lead to an interesting class of problems, the cascading failure. So we have replicated services. One of them goes down. The other one gets overloaded. And now we finally get the first one back up. But now at this point, the second one is congested. The one that kept up is congested and it stops working and it falls over dead. You end up with this bouncing back and forth situation where you have uh, something constantly dying. This is the, the, the VM spin up problem I was talking about just before the actual lecture. In virtual machines, in data centers, we have learned that you do not turn all your virtual machines on at the same time. You don't turn your physical machines on at the same time because you will end up with surges in electric demand. Example of the toaster and the microwave and your laptop and the space heater in, and then you decide that the right thing to do is the bathtub with the toaster. Pass it in, and the breaker flips, and they all go dead. Well, in a data center, the moral equivalent, equivalent of that is literally been out of power for a week because there was a major disaster and now you finally got power back. And of course, you may not even know the power is coming back because the power company is the one that fixed it and your connection suddenly comes on and all of the data center turns on 
pretty much at the same time, and you get this massive inrush because everything starts turning back on, and you trip the breaker, and it all goes back down. And if that's not enough, you can also end up in a situation now where, okay, so now we're going to stage the order in which we bring the machines up. Well, I have 400 virtual machines on this particular rack. If they all start up at exactly the same time, they're all going to be demanding CPU. We undersubscribed. We, we've underallocated resources, right? That's why virtual machines are really cool, because we can promise more things than we actually uh, can deliver. It's like virtual memory. Yeah, yeah, you've got, you know, you've got a terabyte of RAM in your computer. Uh huh. The fact that some of it is just disk drive space. Pay no attention, because hard drives are almost as fast as RAM. Even NVMEs, even really fast NVMEs, aren't as fast as NVMEs. So things fall over because things don't run fast enough for them to get done within the timeout period. So they learn to stagger the startup times of your virtual machines. So you learn over time that don't start everything up all at once. Don't do it all at once, or otherwise you end up with these kinds of cascading failures that turn into these repeating cycles. Power goes out, somebody goes turns the breaker on, the power comes back on, we keep repeating that. And so then people have to go and turn half the machines off, then they flip the breaker on, and then they start turning the machines on, half of them now, and then another 10%, another 10 so you can get back to running. This is why restarting after a major failure can take days. When Facebook fell off the internet, it took them a long time to recover from that. The very first example of a failure that I gave you, which was the, the World of Warcraft Blizzard, November 28th lease, they had exactly the same issue. It took them days to get their system stabilized again, enough to get back to where they could provide the ordinary level of service. Do you want to work in this? Seriously, you might find that flower arranging is a lot less stressful. I don't know, maybe acupuncture is stressful too. So, what are we going to be talking about today? We're going to be talking about this, this issue of achieving consensus. First thing I'm going to have to start with is telling you what consensus is. We're going to have to agree on at least a general sense, it's not super complicated. And then we're going to need to talk about the limitations here. We're going to take some simple model. We're going to say, you know, the problem with this simple model is we're never going to achieve consensus. We're never going to be able to guarantee the achievement. And could say, time to time to go home because we don't need to take this class because we can't, can't solve the problem. Or we can say, you know, we're just going to play that nasty little math mathematician's trick of changing the model. This guy Fisher actually published a workshop paper, and I, I dug up the workshop paper. It was very interesting. He, he published this workshop paper where he kind of outlined the proof, and then like a year or two later, there's this formal mathematical paper that comes out with two other names on it. And this is the one that actually formally proved this problem is not solvable. This was really important because it said this approach isn't generalizable. We're not going to be able to solve this in what seemed like a really useful model, we're not going to be able to do this. So don't waste our time. If you can't solve the problem in theory, change the model. Do something different. Change your assumption. And then we're going to start talking about practical, practical consensus. I mean, this is the lecture that helps you understand why we end up with Paxos and Raft. I was looking at... Um, the slides for Thursday, and in fact, um, I'm going to split it. I think originally I had planned on doing it as one, and I'm like, I'm not going to buy very dense material in 75 minutes. Uh, so we're going to be talking about practical consensus. We're going to start by talking about Paxos, because of course we're going to take the hardest to understand of them, and that way everything else after it will feel easy. It's like going to the gym and deciding that you want to do, you know, 100 muscle ups. Want to muscle up? Some people. 
I don't know anybody who can do 100 muscle ups. I don't know very many people who can do one. So I, I always say the muscle up is in the movie scene where they're hanging on the edge of a cliff and they pull themselves up this way and they lift themselves up and over onto the top. That's a bar muscle up. Ring muscle ups you do the same thing. It's just from rings that are like on ropes. Very impressive. This it's really hard to do, but we're going to get you there. You're going to be doing the distributed systems equivalent of muscle ups. What is consensus? Consensus just means that we have a set of distributed nodes that have reach an agreement on the value of something or on a particular ac action or on a particular timestamp or on the outcome of a transaction. These things are all equivalent. When you go to the eight, put six card in there. And then him goes and looks in your account, or somebody goes and looks in your account and says, oh, okay, you've got that much money. Then it has to withdraw that money. That's where we convert virtual money into virtual money. Draw that money, then we spit it out at you. Could anything go wrong in this process? Has anybody ever had a problem in an ATM? They're surprisingly, they, surprisingly, they often work. But things do go wrong. I once had it give a dollar bill. That was great. That means that somebody miscounted. And in the UK, they can't do that because bills are different sizes. Means. Go to Canada, let's make the bills exactly the same size. If we can reach a consensus, then we can define a consistent point. And our definition of consistency was that means that we are in a correct state. That's why this is important. So what makes this challenging? Why is this hard? Network behavior. We don't have a global clock. We can cheat, as I said, popular technique. We spend a half million dollars per data center and we put a global clock in. And that's how Google solves that problem. But often we don't have that one. And we have to. What can we do if we don't decide to do that? We have bad actors. I mean, look around you. People around you know they're bad actors. Look in the mirror. Ever done anything you would classify as being wrong, malicious, bad? Deliberate or inadvertent. Is there anyone in here who has ever made a mistake? Now see, the people who aren't raising their hands are lying. So they've already proven to us they're bad actors. Can't win that one, can you? And then we have non-deterministic behavior. So we can't even really reason about this stuff because we don't know what the order of events were. And we've already been talking about non-determinism and the effect it has on our reasoning processes. All right, so we're going to create this system where we have a set of processes. And, and the term process, processor, node, I've seen them all used, and they all mean equivalent things when we're talking about this. I've tried to use the term process. All non-faulty processes eventually determine the value, so the outcome of the transaction, the value of the value, the operation that we performed, or the state, whatever it is that we're supposed to determine. And furthermore, all processes determine the same value. Multi. Okay, so we have this very interesting system, but it, it, it's simple. That's its beauty, right? It's simple. Uh, the value is one that was proposed by at least one of the processes. Now, this is important in that. We're not interested in a case where we have some deity-like process outside of the, our, our circle that said, here's the value I want you to have. That's not So how do we achieve this? 
can we actually do that? Yes. It's, there's something wrong with it. It, it. Let's keep it simple. It crashed. Right? That's the easiest thing. Something went wrong, and it can't, uh, it can't achieve. Maybe it's temporary, transient, but there's something wrong with it. Lost a message. It had um, a no RAM, and the contents of its memory are incorrect. So whether it's deliberate or accidental, it doesn't actually matter to me. Our model includes asynchronous messages, so messages can be reordered, delayed, but we are not going to consider corruption of the message. Which is kind of interesting. We're actually assuming that no messages get lost. They just get delayed. You know, it's like that letter from 1954 that the post office found underneath the machine that had been installed in 1953 that they just moved. We're going to deliver that. Here you go. Here's that letter from 1954. Okay, the message didn't get lost, but it might as well have been. That's really brilliant. Uh, the bad behavior is limited to a single process. We're not looking at large Byzantine failure cases yet. We'll talk about them. They make things a lot more challenging. But we're just going to say at most one. So Zero or one. And we use a fail stop model, which is the same as a message delay in, in our case. Because eventually, we'll be able to fix that process and be able to resume the operation. Stop now. It's going to require some external force. The real world is actually more complicated. It will be both a blessing and a curse. Prior to um, FLP, people thought this was a solvable problem. Of course, we can we could come up with lots of models where we can actually sense this. And we'd done this in the real world. We'd had two phase commit protocols since the 1970s when the, um, that was still IBM, where was it IBM? And there, we're building distributed databases and two phase commit protocols. Has anyone ever heard of two phase commit? Or heads nodding. Um, have any of you heard of databases? Okay. So the database community had this issue where they wanted to be able to update things that were uh, related but not necessarily atomically updatable. And this is a mechanism by which you can do an update. The ATM example, which I is always kind of a dumb one, but it's one they like in the database. So we have lots of things that could go wrong. So what we do is we actually create a process by which we say, all of those things happen or none of those things happen. So either you end up with that cash in your hand and your bank balance has been de decremented by the amount you withdrew, or you don't end up with cash in your hand and your bank balance has not been debited. So if the machine jams while it's dispensing that cash, we have to abort the transfer maintain consistency. That's exactly what that is. It's, it's a form of distributed system, a form of census. It's this, this work by um, uh, the FLP. All right. So keep in mind, in our simple model, one of the things that's important about reasoning about that is it means if we do start adding in real world kinds of assumptions like corrupted messages and multiple bad actors and Byzantine failures, so actual bad malicious actors, probably not going to work either. But if we could do that, then we could start looking at the complex. That was the thing. So terminology here that is used in this discussion, we have admissible runs. Remember, runs are just a sequence of events. And that would be, there's, there's a universe of all possible orders of events. And this is why this becomes interesting and complicated to analyze, because in order for us to say that we're going to achieve consensus, there can be no run that doesn't reach a deciding point. So a deciding run is an admissible run where 
some non-faulty processes reach an actual decision. Say that there is consensus when all of the runs, a universe of potential runs, all the different orders in which things could happen, always are deciding. Remember, we said a decision. Decision means that we have a univalent system. There's only one possible outcome. Bivalent system is one where there are two or more possible outcomes. A bivalent system is not deciding. Only a univalent system is deciding. If, if we flip a coin, that system is not univalent. It never converges to a single solution. Oh, it's always going to come up heads. Have a really quick quarter. That would be sort of pointless then. I flip a coin. It has heads on one side and heads on the other side. Hmm. Now it's a univalent system, but it's not very useful. And it sounds like a dumb example, but it is actually kind of relevant to what we're talking about. So the FLP th uh, theorem, used FLP, the, the long enough, I'm not, don't worry about it. FLP theorem actually proves by contradiction. It actually proves that in a system that has one faulting process, there is no correct consensus. There are always runs that do not achieve consensus. Doesn't mean that all runs fail to achieve consensus, but there is at least one run that fails to. And thus, We've now shown that we're living a lot. But we're not going to be able to say none of them achieve. This model will achieve consensus in many of the possible ones. How are we going to get rid of the ones that we I know, we'll just lay them off. So I'm going to sketch the proof. The goal here is to help you understand the general idea behind this. If you want specific details, dive into the proof itself. It is not a particularly long proof. It's, I think, five thing. It mostly relies on, on a particular lemma. This is modular design and mathematics, right? You have a proof. You have some very important point you want to prove. So you pull it out. You make this smaller statement, and that proves a larger statement. Modular design and math, probably where we got. Probably never thought of it that way, did you? Can we identify a configuration and run that do not reach a deciding state? That's really the interesting question here. All we need is one example where we don't achieve consensus, establish that not possible. Now, assuming that it's not a particular example, it's instead a general way of finding one of those. And then question two, okay, so uh, can we find one admissible schedule in our system? So now this is getting very, very precise. Is there a particular order of events that can happen in the system that will cause us to not be able to achieve consensus? So basic walkthrough, we start with a very simple system where every process is just simply deciding a binary value. True, is it false? Really, really simple. We're not actually trying to keep track of some complex value here. We're just simply trying to keep track of a zero or a one. We are allowed to have a faulty node. It's not required, it is just simply allowed. We have no faulty nodes. Maybe we'll be able to make it work, but that's not. Messages can be reordered, but they are never lost. Hence the 1954 letter exam. So, gee, I got this message from 20 million years ago. What am I supposed to do with it?
as I said, the key to this discussion is lemma. So they assume there is an initial configuration lemma. They assume there is an initial configuration and that the final decision is not predetermined. Remember, that was one of those things that I said, is that we don't have somebody who's told us, here's the answer you have to find. We don't know the answer. And the census value is based upon something that is proposed by one of the processes within the system. The final decision that we reach is going to depend on the event schedule. And if you think about that, this becomes pretty simple. If, if just the faulting process says, well, no, that's false, and everybody else says it's true, and you think of like two-phase commit. Phase commit is a protocol where everyone who is engaged in the transaction has to agree the transaction can roll forward. If one of them delays their answer, it can always change the final outcome. Phase commit on to don't, don't admit to having ever heard of it or have forgotten it because you're like, cares about this. So the interesting conclusion from this lemma is basically the, a very constrained version of our initial theorem is that um, we have to start with an initial bivalent, bivalent configuration. If you don't have a bivalent configuration at the beginning, it means that the outcome of that has been And this is going to tie into what we talked about last time, which was as we start doing cuts through the system, Try to order things. We are looking at paths through that system and successors, and you'll have the successor and the predecessor are related. Essentially, if you know what the decision is at, at this point, at some point there or earlier, that outcome became observable. You knew that's what, what the outcome was going to be. Obviously, at the point we make a decision, you know what the outcome is. I have a question. Okay. Or I didn't know you thought maybe you were next. Um in this case the configuration would actually be how many processes there are. And what you know what what's the value we're trying to agree on. So the lemma is a specific instance of this where we're not saying it, it's no longer as absolute abstract in general, now it's very specific. We just take a single binary value. Imagine this is um, an evaluation of a true statement, logical statement, and everyone's agreement on that in order for us to achieve consensus. I mean, there, that, that's the other interesting thing about this is there's this part of the definition that requires everybody has to agree on the outcome. Morning. Ah, oh, I guess the stream is working. Maybe he couldn't hear, so he decided to come in. Or, you know, transit in Vancouver. It's raining. And it doesn't rain here, so they're not used to dealing with that. I mean, I kind of laugh because I've grown up in places with snow. And anybody here grow up with snow? Um, it's... Uh, inches of snow, sorry, I have you know, five or six centimeters of snow, and I've got everything down here. I mean, I've been in Atlanta when it snowed. It, it, they do the same exact thing there, except that Vancouver is not in the southern United States. And this is a university that has two winter terms, no spring, no fall, two winter terms. And I swear, I think that's just, you know, trying to compensate for, um, we're, yes, we're Canadian. That's why we have a long winter. Nobody would have complained if you called it fall and spring. Uh, maybe. Anybody? Am I the only person who's. All right. So, at any rate, um, the point is that what we're doing is we're, we're, we're constraining ourselves a little bit more. This is a, a legitimate subset of the larger question that we posed. We had this larger system with lots of lots of places where things could be variable. And we're saying, but we only need one instance of a case that's not citable that fits inside of our larger definition to 
to prove the point that we can't actually achieve our larger definition. Because this is a, strictly a subset of the original system that we were in. It means that the very first state in the system has two possible outcomes. That there's at least one path through that system, no, I guess there's at least one pair of paths through that system that, that reach a different end value. If the outcome is always the same, regardless of what happens in the system, comes a you know mental masturbation exercise. We're going to do lots of work to come up with one conclusion. That's not interesting. I mean, they're, they're the only reason this becomes interesting is because we don't actually know what the outcome is going to be, but we do know that there are at least two possible outcomes. That there's at least one path through here that reaches one outcome and one path that reaches the other outcome. But at some point, we are committed to one of those outcomes. If the first state commits us to one of those outcomes, not interesting. We're not going to consider that. If the first state has at least two outcomes, and we set a binary system up, so there's only two outcomes that are possible. Now it's bivalent. Does that help? Great. Now it's bivalent. But as we step through this system, there comes a point at which it's not bivalent anymore. We now know what the outcome has to be. And that stage it becomes univalent. But those are different paths. So there's two, at least two different paths, one which becomes univalent for one outcome, one that becomes univalent for the other outcome. And that's, hopefully that makes sense, right? And there's at some point where you reach that tipping point and you now know what's going to have to happen. It's like watching a you know, mediocre movie. You don't want to start the movie and know what's going to happen at the end. You have to get the suspense going. You have to have something that keeps you involved in it. So, point in FLP is that at some stage, there is a state, you recognize that picture, because it's the same picture I sold for the last, uh, last lecture, for walking through you know, a, a series of states. At some point, we know what the outcome is going to be. Because at some point, this one is bivalent, one just above the line. People on the stream can't actually see the laser point. But on the vector, right? On the, uh... So at some point, the system goes from being bivalent. Now a message arrives. We transition to a state where all of the outcomes are, are known now, be the same. Now we've, we've received consensus. This is the point. Ah. This is the point, that one just on the other side of of the dividing line, that it's now become univalent. So whatever that message was, that's the one that determined the actual outcome. But there was a different path through here. So it could have been the other message here as well. So those two messages both made that univalent. This decision point, the only one that we show on this picture, that leads us to the other outcome. Go to the left. Ah. You're right. Just keeping me honest here. Yeah, you're right. So it's the highlighted one that that becomes the only outcome possible. If I took that picture off, then it would be. If I took that picture off. If I took that note off, the one on the far left at the bottom there, then yes, the dog, it would, would be here. The picture is kind of misleading. What happens when you see you look at it afterwards and go, oh. Great. So now I have to redraw the whole picture. Or like that. Actually, let's see. Yeah, we could do like, like, like that. Yes. I don't know. I'm sure we could draw a line. Uh, we could, we could create a, a hyperplane that would, um, divide. Space. It's for illustrative purposes, not demonstrative. Not definitive purposes. Change the definition. When the system doesn't work, just but how do you define it? 
So in the FLP theorem, remember, the system allowed us to reorder the messages. So they could be delayed, they could be ordered. That's perfectly allowable. This is why this melts down. Hopefully the fix starts to become fairly obvious at this point, because I've already alluded to it, which is we provide time bounds on things. Once we say that messages can't be arbitrarily delayed, we're going to be able to start reasoning about the system again. It's not as strong as we want that. We wanted this to work. And I decided this was appropriate time to grab a classic piece of art and put it in here so that you feel like you're getting cultural benefits here as well. Probably have seen variations of this is actually a copy of the poem. It was interesting searching for that and finding uh, on a uh, doc and finding that it had all sorts of other versions of that, including from Scream movie. It's either just come out or it's coming. Yeah. In, in a horror movie. I don't like that. I do like that. I gotta go see the original bodies. Where they actually have a body count. At one point they kill a fly and it goes body count. I'm not a big horror movie fan. Horror movies. Fun. All right, so let's put this all together now. We have a system. All it does is decide if binary condition true or false. The lemma said we have an initial configuration. We have a non-preterminate and final decision. Our final decision determines on the, the, the schedule of events. In other words, the order in which the events occur or arise within our system. We have to have started from an interesting Starting point, we had to have had a bivalent configuration to start with. Otherwise, this isn't interesting because there's nothing, no order of the events, no run would lead to any other place other than the same decision. That doesn't provide us with a counterexample. Remember, we're just looking for a counterexample. Why we get to drive things as long as we're still within the space. Some message has to be able to make that system become univalent. Since it's a bivalent system, that message is the, at least that message is the place where we split. We have at least one outcome that comes one to one determination, one outcome that comes to the other determination. But the order that we walk through the graph is going to change if we change the order of the messages. That's why reordering messages becomes kind of the fly in the ointment here. It becomes the, the issue that makes it hard for us reach consensus. Since we have one faulty node that's possible, we actually have the possibility that a message doesn't get delivered before this run becomes univalent. So we now have a problem that As we've allowed a message to be arbitrarily delivered. So all we know is that there is an admissible non-deciding schedule. And that was all we were looking for. We don't even know what it is. This doesn't give you the steps necessary to find what that particular schedule was. It's really more abstract than that. It's just saying we know one exists might be really hard for you to find it. You might have to search a very large search space, potentially, to find it. But eventually, you will find it. Oh, my God. This is really the lie. We've been telling you this distributed system stuff is great. And now I'm sitting here saying, ha ha, you can't drop it anymore. Well, you can. You can take a couple of years. But it's a big lie. Does that mean that we can't actually come to an agreement? Well, if you've ever tried to get an agreement, get friends to agree on what to have for dinner, you know that's probably required. Ever done that? I don't know. Hey, let's go out and get something to eat. What do you feel like? Well, I don't know. Let's go to Chinese. 
that yesterday. Um, okay, Italian. No, sorry, I'm doing keto. Play the whole veto game, and nobody ever decides, and it's a perfect example of a non-deciding process. Consensus is very difficult to achieve, especially with something as complicated as humans. A non-binary decision. We couldn't even get it to work in a binary decision case. So in the real world, our model isn't even that constrained. Faults are inevitable. They do happen. It's not at most one. It'll be more than one, and we'll have to deal with it. Network delays will happen. Where we started there. So what are we going to do? And in fact, the most powerful thing we can actually do here is to say, you know what? We're not going to allow arbitrary delay of messages. That isn't in the FLP theorem. That's my observation. That's my explanation to you why you don't want to actually give up on this course yet. So let's change the model. Let's change our assumption. Let's change the system's properties. Let's find situations where the protocol does actually work and see if we can constrain that and still make this useful. I start off by saying that distributed systems were about dealing with failure. And I pointed out, and I was being honest with you, there's always some failure you can't handle. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't design and build systems that can handle an awful lot of failure. You cannot build a system that will survive based on what we know right now, that will survive the destruction of the known universe. Actually, we're even more constrained than that. You cannot actually protect us from Marvin the Martian blowing up the Earth. I've got to get a clip of that and put it in here, because I don't know that everybody has ever seen Marvin the Martian. Older than I am, and that's old. We can not protect ourselves from all possible failures, but we don't just simply... Stay in bed, pull the covers up over our head, and go, I give up. I can't solve all the world's problems. Oh, well. We can solve an awful lot of them. So now the question becomes, knowing that, what can we actually do? How are we going to actually be able to come up with a consensus? Eventually, you know, in your group of friends, you say, you know what? Here's where I'm going to get some food. If you want to tag along, come with me. If you don't want to tag along, go do your own thing. Because I'm hungry. And now I'm hangry. Consensus is actually possible in less broad models. I've already mentioned two-phase commit. There's this interesting thing called three-phase commit, which is really just asynchronous messaging in a two-phase commit model. Got it a lot harder. Doesn't that change anything? Not that that's a bad thing, but when you're taking money from the ATM, you don't really want async. You don't really want to know that eventually the ATM spit your money out. That was two weeks after I got out. Yeah, somebody got the jackpot. Maybe you, you, wouldn't that be a great world where you could walk up to an ATM and it would just spit someone else's money out at you? Huh. Except that, that it could equally take your money and spit it out and give it to somebody else. And you're like, uh, Paxos. We are going to speak about a lovely, absolutely beautiful, I have pictures of it, absolutely gorgeous island in Greece. How many of you have been to Greece? I was supposed to go to Greece. There was um, a conference there, Hero Sys, going to be in May of 2020. That was going to be in the end of my glorious UK adventure. Because I went and did three months at Microsoft Research. That was supposed to end at the end of March, and then I was going to go. I had some invites to give talks to a couple of different rounds. Uh, so, um, uh, MPI, Germany, Software Institute, and then it's got uh, Mothi had invited me to give a talk to the group there at uh, ETH. And I was like, I was going to just bum around, see some friends, have a nice time, and then go to this conference in Greece and enjoy Heraklion. Not on Paxos, though, but it was Greece. How many of you have been to Paxos? How many of you knew that Paxos was in Greece? Yeah, sort of, kind of. 
It actually is a real place. And I have a picture of an actual clock in Paxos. Yeah. No, it's absolutely gorgeous. Right? It's absolutely beautiful. Totally. I don't know why Lamport decided to pick on Paxos. Maybe he vacationed there and said this is great. And I'm going to spoil it for everyone else by telling them about how they how, how they um, solve their legislative problems. Yes, the actual Paxos paper is this very interesting paper about how the legislature in Paxos, which is not based in anything in reality, how the legislature in Paxos actually functions, where nobody's in the room at the same time, but they have a mechanism by which they can propose bills and people vote on them and they make decisions, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. Um, and if you're not familiar with two case as the way I think of Paxos, kind of like taking two phase commit. Two phase commit, you have a decider. In Paxos, they call it the leader. They do the same thing in RAF. In a two phase commit system, your decider is generally a single machine. Oops, sorry. Tried to trip me. Got him by stepping on his my big ass boot. Um, In Paxos, we don't have a fixed leader. What we have is we have a, an election for a leader. They do the same thing in RAF. The way they do this is a little bit different, but it's the same basic idea. Eventually, someone has to decide what the outcome will be. And so, they're all very similar, with the difference being in the deep. The face commit is pretty simple. In theory, in practice, it can be quite complicated. Start looking at the way the discrete actions function. Two-phase commit means that I own some resources, you own some resources, we own some resources, we own some resources, and we have to coordinate. So we say you're the leader, and so then you're doing something, and you say, okay. I need to start a transaction. You ask the leader, the leader, okay, here's a transaction identifier. And then you say, okay, now I need to talk to you. And then I need to talk to you. And then I need to talk to you. And then I'm going to start making some decisions. And then I need you to make this change. You need to make this change. You need to make that change. And in the meantime, in the background, we're talking to the, the, the coordinator as well, the leader. And at some point you say, okay, I am done making all of my changes. So you say, I'm done. And now you have to actually make a decision on whether or not any of it happened or none of it happened. The binary condition, so that, that whole binary thing is actually not far off from what we actually did. There's lots of details and nuances underneath the covers, but basically all the leader is going to do is make this binary decision. Did we reach a consensus or did we not reach a consensus? And so now there are, the reason is two phase. So in the first phase, he said, I'm done. And he then says, okay, are you ready to commit your transaction? Are you ready to commit your transaction? Are you ready to commit your transaction? And if any of us say no, he says, sorry, your transaction aborted. And if one of us doesn't answer, he can time it out and he can say, sorry, your transaction didn't commit. The one that didn't get an, didn't answer may not know what the what actually happened. And so later it can come back up and it can say, yo, what happened? And he can say, uh, that, that aborted. And you can say, okay, I can forget all that state. I didn't make any of those changes. Pay no attention to the people behind the curtain. We all agree. Yeah, I'm ready to commit. He goes back and he says, your transaction is committed. So that's the end of the commit phase, or the prepare phase, sorry. Your transaction is committed. He records that that transaction committed. Then he tells us, your transaction committed. If one of us is down, you can retry, you can tell us again, or normally what happens is you go and you ask, what was the outcome of that transaction? Because you crashed, you came back up, and you say, I had this pending transaction. I committed, I, I, I said I was prepared to commit this transaction. I don't know whether I should or not. Tell me. Well, okay, maybe he's failed. In which case, then I can't do anything about it. I have to keep that state around until I can get a message back from him. He never comes back, then I'm, I don't know what to do. 
This is data corruption. Transactional systems don't prevent those kinds of failures, a permanent failure of the coordinator from disappearing. Can't handle that. That's a failure outside of my model. But in the model, eventually it comes back. It comes back. I say, okay, uh, now I know what to do. Now I can commit changes. I am responsible for being able to commit my changes. If I tell you I can commit these changes and then I melt down, a computer burns, and someone conveniently comes in and hoses it down with lots of water and foam and, and whatnot, and then the, the people who specialize in data recovery come in and they scrape the iron oxide off the floor. There are people who not. They scrape the actual hard drives that have melted onto the floor, and they read the data contents off of them. Maybe they can get it back. Maybe they can't. If they can't get it back, they have data corruption. Remember, data corruption wasn't in our model. OK, fine. I don't have to solve all the world's problems. That's an extreme example. I have solutions for that. They're called backups. Of course, there's a backup. The only time that people find out that their backups didn't work is when they're trying to restore. And that's actually when they call in the people who can, who can scrape iron oxide off the ground and read the data back off of it. It is eerily scary how much data those people can actually recover from physically damaged disk drives, melted disk drives. They do actually pull data out of, the, out of melted data centers. That is So now you have a going to give up his career in um, computer science and go become a firefighter to learn how to sc scrape iron oxide off the floor and recover the data content. 42. Oh, thank God, there's at least some reference that people get. What is six times nine? What is six times nine was the question. They didn't know the question until they had the answer. Then they went back and got the question. And the best part is that Douglas Adams didn't realize that six times nine is actually 42, base 13. Um, depends on how you design it, right? But if you don't wait until the leader comes back, because the leader's never coming back, sorry, somebody shot him. Um, and we, the iron oxide recovery process didn't work. You're done. Now you have a data recovery problem, and you have to restore the system. That's outside of our failure model. So we're going to talk about Paxos, and we're going to talk about this thing called Raft, which is a reinvention of view stamp replication. The difference is that view stamp replication was proposed by a woman, and, Paxo, and Raft was proposed by a man. I'm sure that the women in here have never experienced this before, where they're ignored. And Barbara Liskoff is not a person to be ignored. She basically was the she's a Turing Award winner, right? She's amazing. She wrote stamp replication paper just before Lamport wrote the Paxos paper. And her paper was published about nine years before the Paxos. And then 20 years later, somebody publishes a easier to understand protocol than Paxos. And at the presentation of this paper, I kid you not, someone asked him, so how is this different than view stamp replication? And he'd never heard of view stamp replication. His supervisor, his PhD supervisor, had John Osterhout had been around for a long time. And he knew Barbara Liskov. And he would have known that work. So what are we talking about? FLP theorem basically gives us this observation that we cannot achieve consensus in this particularly broad and useful model. So we're going to have to come up with less broad and hopefully useful models. We need consensus. Got to have to change the model. The Kobayashi Maru. Now, if you don't like the test, hack the system and change it. 
don't get any idea. Any questions? And look at that. I actually did it. And it's still 16 minutes of four. I actually did it. It's 914. Well, thank you for um, attending today's boring, monotonous lecture. I'll see you on Thursday, where we actually will be talking through Paxos. Um, I have to decide. I still have two days, well, a day and a half now to do that. Uh, I have to decide whether or not I'll put a two-phase commit discussion in or not. But I think that I did that today, so I think I might not. I'll just go into Paxos. So we're going to take the hard one, the really hard one. And if you're feeling bored, you can go dig up Lamport's part-time parliament paper and read it. Um, and you will be like 99.99% .99 of the world. And you will go, what the hell did I just read? I think part of the reason that that paper fell behind a filing cabinet for eight years was no one understood it, except Lamport. And with that, in the stream. Thanks for everybody. Catch you later.